two, one. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Systems for Action Research Program in our regularly recurring Research in Progress webinar series. Uh, for those of you who might be new to our program, new to our webinar series, um, Systems for Action, S4A, is a um, signature research program of, of RWJF, and um, our focus is on learning how to build a culture of health and health equity by helping um, delivery and financing systems that, that work to support medical, social, and public health services, helping those systems better connect and work together to tackle um, issues of health and, and health equity for um, communities across the country. Um, as, we, as we normally do, we, we do this webinar series about twice a month. Um, we typically feature uh, research from one of our funded research teams in the S4A program. That's the chance for them to, to uh, let us know what they're learning along the way at various stages of, um, of the research uh, process. Um, and um, uh, today's webinar is a little bit different. We're, we're featuring um, some colleagues uh, who, are, um, uh, who are doing very interesting, very, very relevant work uh, to the S4A program. Uh, again, help, helping us learn how to, how to help organizations work across sectors to improve health and health equity. Um, and so the topic of uh, today's webinar will be featuring um, lessons learned from the collaborative approach to public goods investment or CAPG. Um, really interesting uh, financing um, and collective action approach um, that I think um, all of us will be interesting, interested in hearing, hearing an update um, about. Uh, <clears throat> two of the, we're really fortunate today to have two of the leaders and originators of this CAPG model. Uh, we're going to hear, hear from them today. Uh, Dr. Lynn Nichols, uh, who uh, is now with the Urban Institute, uh, and Dr. Lauren Taylor, um, who is uh, at um, New York University. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, but both, both of these colleagues are well known in the fields of health policy research, uh, health services research, um, uh, health economics in, um, in Lynn's case as well, um, has done some great work in a number of, of these spaces and venues. Um, um, and uh, as I mentioned, over the last four, five, six years, they've been working on this new model, the CAPGE model, uh, for um, help, helping organizations work together across sectors to improve health and particularly addressing some of the financing and economic issues that, as we all know and have learned, can, can really um, torpedo the, <laughs> these types of collaborative approaches unless you can, you can get it right. Um, so um, uh, again, it's our normal format, I'm gonna turn it over to our, our two um, speakers today to take us through their, uh, their work uh, and lessons learned. Uh, we will have time for uh, questions uh, and answers uh, a little bit later in, in the hour today. Uh, we encourage you um, to use the Q&A feature, the Q&A box to submit your questions online. You can do that at any time as we move along the presentation and we'll keep, keep an eye out for that and definitely we'll have time um, for, uh, for getting to those questions. So with that, um, when we do have some slides giving you a little more background um, on Dr. Nichols and uh, Dr. Taylor um, and um, I think with that, I will turn, turn it over to, to Lynn and Lauren. Okay, well, thank you, Glenn. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, with Lauren. And of course, uh, I believe it is the case that actually you sent us the first email like an hour and a half after our paper came out in Health Affairs in, in uh, August of 18. So, so you get the prize for being the most supportive child in America. And we appreciate that very much because you have been an intellectual colleague and a, and a leader and a mentor in many ways. And so uh, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here today and, and participate in, in your program. Um, it, this is definitely, I wanna emphasize the title on your slide. This is work in progress, okay? We, we are in the middle of it. We think that um, we're gonna be able to continue these experiments for a while, but, but who knows what's really gonna happen in the long run. And we'll talk about all that. So the evolution, uh, I'll just say, if you really want to do something creative in this space, the first key to life is find a really smart young co-author. I saw Lauren give a talk 
on social determinants. I think now at least five, maybe even six years ago, she was just starting her PhD at Harvard. And of course she has an MDiv from Harvard and she didn't tell you, but she also has an MPH uh, from Yale. And, and so anyway, as she gave the best talk I'd seen at the time uh, and I've ever seen really on social determinants. And I was so impressed and I went up to her and I said, I know you don't know me and there's no reason to, but if you will teach me social determinants, I will find us an economic model to incentivize investment upstream. I was frankly blowing smoke. I just figured how hard could this be? It was obviously a public good problem. She did her job in a month. It took me a year, which is something about the relative intellectual power of our capacities. But I'll just say we did find a model that we think was useful is useful to solve it. It's called Vickery Clark Groves. It's now taught in sort of the back end of game theory classes. It's not very widely used, but we discovered while that model can solve what we call the free rider problem, and Lauren's gonna talk about that in a bit more detail, but we, it can solve that problem with the technical solution from Vickery Clark Groves, but that particular solution is not gonna be sustainable. So we had to modify it some, and that's really what we did in the last few years. And that's what we call CAPTCHI, the Collaborative Approach to Public Good Investment. So I'm going to let, and the, and, the, and the links here, just so you know, the first one is to the paper itself, which is open access. The second one is to the Health Affairs blog, reporting on progress two years in. And the final one is today's website, the website where we hold all our materials and future developments and so forth, if anybody's curious. And of course, you'll get these slides when the presentation's over. So Lauren, take it away for the mob. Thanks, Len. So we tried to um, bucket this presentation into essentially three sections. I'm gonna take this first section and give you really a thumbnail view of how CAPTCHI works, what it was designed to do, and a little bit high level about the mechanisms and kind of processes that a community would go through to use CAPTCHI to finance and organize themselves towards some kind of social determinants of health or community investment. The second piece is going to be, I'm going to turn it back to Len, and Len is going to um, really drill down into a couple of the case studies that we have um, that really illustrate both the joys and the complexities of having done this in the real world. And then we're going to close it out with a little bit of a higher level reflection, like across, you know, as Len said now, probably five plus years of thinking and really three years of working with communities. What do we think we've learned? So I'm going to take this first chunk and try and just, again, give a thumbnail version of what CAPG was designed to do and how it works in concept. So what we were really trying to do here is to solve what we consider to be a free rider or a wrong pocket problem. Free rider would be the traditional economic language for it. Wrong pocket problem has kind of become the term of art in social determinants uh, circles. I think maybe originally coined by, by David Erickson out at the San Francisco Fed. But what that means essentially is the idea that investors don't recoup all or sometimes even most of the value of an investment they put in. So you can think about a free rider problem at least in two ways. You could think about a free rider problem just within healthcare space. So I, I spent a lot of time in Boston and you could think about a lot of discussion. We need to do more around, let's say housing. Uh, and you could think about, we've got competing hospitals in Boston and what winds up happening often is each winds up looking at the other and saying, well, you should really make an investment in housing, don't you think? <laughs> but no one wants to make the big investment in housing for fear that if they do, that investment in housing could benefit their rival or competitor. And they, as the investor, would not be recouping the full benefit of that investment. That would be particularly true if they weren't able to target that housing investment for people who they held, let's say, total cost of care risk for. Sometimes we see that happening more, but more often it's very difficult to put a lot of money into a community asset and know for sure that that asset isn't going to generate value for a multitude of players. In fact, that's really what a public good is. So we see this free rider problem within a healthcare world, but you can also think about it across sectors, right? So in many cases, you know, we're seeing evidence now come out that let's say home delivered meals create some value return to the healthcare industry if you're targeting it to people who live with chronic conditions and let's say are homebound. So there's been evidence, Seth Berkowitz and others that say home delivered meals can really bring down the healthcare cost for certain kinds of uh, people who are in managed care plans. Now, historically, who made those investments? Historically, it wasn't healthcare. It wasn't health plans or hospitals. It was, you know, 
your area, metro area on aging, or it was a philanthropy, maybe the state. And so there again, we see there's someone else, not healthcare, making an investment in, let's say, home delivered meals, but it's generating a return to healthcare. And so this kind of leakage between sectors and between organizations in the same sector, Len and I thought was really a, a great impediment to getting the right level, the socially optimal level of investment in social determinants of health programming. And so that's what CAPGE is in part designed to fix. The way CAPGE tries to provide a fix for that problem is really twofold. One, by creating a governance structure for multiple sectors and organizations to come together. So like a venue, a meeting that goes on a bunch of people's Google and Outlook calendars that say, come to this and we will talk about and figure out which community asset or investment we might wanna invest in. And then critically, <clears throat> assigning each stakeholder a price that is not the whole price of the investment, but is part of the price of the investment. And that price assignment is really, in some ways, where the magic of CAPGE happens. So let me just try and walk you through graphically how uh, I conceptualize CAPGE working. Critical to CAPGE is the idea that you have a trusted broker. And this has become common now if you think about all sorts of community efforts. There's often an integrator or a backbone organization. We call it a trusted broker. So you have a trusted broker who can be many types of organizations. Sometimes it's local philanthropy. Um, sometimes we've seen it be part of local government, but someone sits at the center kind of coordinating across the other stakeholders who show up. And then the other stakeholders who show up and are part of a CAPTI project can really vary from community to community. There's nothing about the CAPTI model that says you have to have X number of players or you have to have this kind of representation from healthcare and this kind of representation from social services. The coalition that comes together and decides we wanna do CAPG can be totally flexible and responsive to local conditions. So here I've said like, let's imagine we have hospital A and hospital B. Let's imagine we have insurer A and insurer B. These would historically, I think, be people who don't collaborate on much because they're competitors in the same market, but CAPG creates a platform for them to come together and actually do something collaboratively. And then we could think about other players who are important to community decisions, community-based organizations, a foundation, maybe you have police or you have local government. And whoever that is, we consider the kind of coalition to be in some sense closed, meaning you decide who's in and who's gonna be part of the CAPG project and you decide who's out. It's not forever, but it's nice to have a sense of like a bounded group who's really going on this journey. So the first part is that once the community decides and the coalition decides, this is our priority, this is the kind of project we wanna do, and they can choose whatever they want based on whatever rationale they want. Although Len and I have seen most often communities are choosing based on some combination of what the community needs in their opinion and what the available evidence base says is effective. And sometimes that's cost effective or just effective in the sense of moving the needle on health. Once you've selected the project, each of these stakeholders has an opportunity to bid, meaning they can confidentially write down, this is what it would, this is what the value of that project would be for me. This is what I would be willing to pay, or this would be what I'm willing to contribute to make that project come alive. So each of the stakeholders writes down their bid and they confidentially submit it to the trusted broker. The confidential piece is key because this is how we get hospital A and hospital B to play at the same table at the same time without that crippling fear that one is gonna find out the other's trade secrets or one is going to exploit the other. So the key piece here and the decision point on whether or not the project goes forward is quite simple. The trusted broker now has all those confidential bids. If the sum of the confidential bids exceeds the cost of the project, the project is greenlit. There is enough collective value of that intervention among the stakeholders to make the project go. Then the TB goes to price assignment, which I'll say a bit about. If for some reason the TB collects all the bids and says, look, I got bids that add up to $800, but creating this playground in the center of town costs $1,000, that's a time where, you know, conceptually, theoretically, you walk away and the trust broker says, look, there's just not enough collective valuation for this project in this community right now. We can come back in 30 days, we can come back in a year and rebid, but it just isn't there right now. 
And so I think it's always important to know, like keeping that walk away option is powerful um, because it means it, it's a preventative strategy to keep strategic underbidding or um, an effort to deliberately lie about how much you're willing to uh, submit to the project, keep that a little bit at bay. Let's go down the path of saying the bids do exceed the cost of the project. Then the trusted broker goes back to each of the stakeholders with a price. That price will always be lower than the bid because remember, if the sum of the bids exceeds the cost, there's some surplus to redistribute to these stakeholders. And that's where we get to a world of, okay, now everyone has actually been charged a price lower than their bid. The project can go forward. And depending on the criteria the community used, that project may also generate some return on investment, financial health, or otherwise. Once the kind of price assignment has happened, then the coalition contracts with a provider of services or a vendor. Uh, Len will walk you through a couple instances and tell you more about what that can look like. The provider of the services actually interacts with, you know, the healthier community or the, the beneficiaries, sometimes their patients, sometimes their clients. And then the value of that healthier community presumably flows back to the stakeholder group. So the key elements of the model, I've talked you through it visually, but just to think about kind of a hit list, the two key conditions from a governance perspective are really that there is a local stakeholder coalition and there is a trusted broker. So someone who the key players and particularly the health insurers, healthcare uh, systems, healthcare providers, someone that they trust to really be able to hold bids confidential and kind of manage that bidding and price assignment process. If those two things are in place, then CAPG really can provide a viable way to work through this free rider concern. So the key elements are that the stakeholders agree on the SUH project to explore. Len and I have never had a hand in deciding that for communities. They get to select, on their, select what they want based on the criteria that they want. Stakeholders reveal their willingness to pay. That's what we call the bid to the trusted broker only. So that confidentiality piece is key. Only the trusted broker knows the cost of the project. So that's important to, again, to prevent that kind of strategic underbidding that is a risk or a vulnerability of the model. If the sum of the bids exceeds the cost, the TB, the trusted broker can assign fair price, prices so that the surplus can be shared. And then the money flows just to get a sense of like where the dollars are. The dollars flow from the stakeholders to the trusted broker into kind of a central account. And then from the central from the trusted broker out to a vendor or a service provider who then is really doing the service delivery. The key roles are really fourfold. We've talked about them. One is the trusted broker to be chosen by local stakeholders. There's nothing about the CAPG model that requires that person to be a 501c3 or a corporation or a, anything. It's really uh, entirely up to the community. The stakeholders, who we sometimes call investors, and again, that's totally flexible, who's at the table. I should also note there can be people at the table, and we have communities who have invited people to be stakeholders, even though they expect a $0 financial bid from that person. So sometimes there's a community-based organization who you say, they've just got to be there. Like, we would lack legitimacy as a coalition if they weren't part of this. And so even if you kind of anticipate or know, when it comes time to bid, they're going to write down $0 it still can make sense to have those folks be in the proverbial uh, tent. Vendors and then the technical assistants have been kind of Len, myself, uh, our friends and colleagues from Altarum and a few others. Len, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Well, thanks Lauren, great job uh, describing the model in, in non-algebraic terms, that was, that was beautiful. Um, so uh, we published this paper in the fall of 18, in August of 18. And, you know, it's really true. We got Glenn's email first and then a few more, but what astounded us was how many communities in various ways came to each of us or one of us and said, can we do this model here? We really didn't know what kind of effect or impact it would have. And so we decided, well, maybe we should explore what we could do with communities. And, and so through the generosity of the Commonwealth Fund, the Episcopal Health Foundation from Texas, Missouri Foundation for Health and California Healthcare, we, we did what, what everybody called a feasibility study. And we, we basically just designed four webinars to teach the model and how the governance processes might work in real life. 
We, we worked on our adaptation of Vickery Clark Groves to make it more uh, sustainable in the, in the CAPTCHI frame. And we invited about 35 people to the first webinar in something like June or July of 19 before COVID. And much to our shock, we had over 200 people and from Alaska to Massachusetts. I mean, the truth is there's a hunger for trying to solve these upstream problems. And there's a tremendous hunger for a possible solution that looks like a financing tool that might work. Out of those communities, we did a quite serious survey, what we call the community checklist. Really, we were assessing the maturity and strength and, and breadth and durability of the local coalitions that Lauren talked about that are key. We asked who could play the role of the trusted broker who looked like natural candidates. And we really wanted to know how long they'd been together and had they put their own money into something and done something collaboratively together. Because a lot of what this is about, at least I would say it's part evangelical, it's teaching people in the United States who are very competitive by nature and by training to collaborate and that it's okay to collaborate. And in fact, they're gonna be better off if they collaborate and that is not something that's sort of in the water. So it, it does take a fair bit of, of work. Well, anyway, we took the 23 completed um, applications and we picked the top 10 that seemed most likely, I'll never forget, Linda Abrams from Commonwealth saying, Lynn, this is not, we're not ready for a randomized clinical trial. This is proof of concept. So pick the ones you think are most likely to succeed. We did that. And then after we got started, Albany, New York, which was not ready at the beginning, uh, joined the party. So we really had 11 potential candidates. And we started doing site visits in January of 2020. You may recall COVID was just about to cross the Pacific Ocean. And it shut down travel in March of 2020. And we completed the last site visits via Zoom. Thank God for Zoom. I will point out, we surely launched this project at the worst possible time in the history of civilization with the possible exception of the Civil War because COVID made every organization, not just healthcare, but social service, especially actually, pivot to triage and, and appropriate, um, how we're gonna keep our, our mission alive. So it was a very difficult time, but out of that process, we did able, we were able to find these different coalitions. It was heartening to see them across the country and three brave communities actually made it over the finish line to implementation. Cleveland, Ohio, Waco, Texas, and Albany, New York, they're marked in red. Two are still working on implementation. We'll talk a little bit about DC at the end of our talk today and, and also Annapolis, Maryland is moving forward. The rest of them all have various stories, some of which are good, some of which are not so good about why they have stopped working toward CAPTCHI. But the point is, we have three that are live, and, and that's what we're going to talk about the rest of today. So in Albany, New York, uh, the trusted broker there is a, is, a, is a performing provider system. If you're familiar with New York's Medicaid DISRIP application and, and program, uh, so they're like a convener. Uh, by nature, they also sort of function like an IPA for the CBOs vis-a-vis -vis the health plans and the, the alliance itself is a, is a joint venture of health plans and hospitals. So it's a perfect uh, sort of trusted broker creature. And they decided to use their collective resources to try to do something about vaccine hesitancy in the capital region. And they were able to get uh, 40,000 shots in arms in a way that wouldn't have happened otherwise using the CAPTCHI model. The next Example is Waco, Texas. Uh, there we have a, an interesting coalition. Uh, Prosper Waco is a trusted broker that's really a kind of, um, uh, I would call it a pseudo chamber of commerce. It's, it's about economic and, and social development in, in Waco and McLennan County. And they found a partner in Baylor and Scott White Health Plan. In addition, the Waco Police Department. Waco basically, like a lot of places around the country, is observing pretty serious issues with behavioral health delivery and capacity. And what they're doing here is with two very different sets of target groups, one being nominated by the health plan, one being nominated by the police department. Waco Connect is a project that provides complex case management for whatever these families need for folks having mental health issues. And, and so that, that is ongoing as we speak. But the one we really wanna highlight is Cleveland because Cleveland is in many ways 
they were first and they uh, have have done the most to, to generate, I would say, evidence at the moment. They decided together in July of 2020 to do medically tailored meals for older adults with at least one chronic condition that are also socially isolated. And basically the idea is to have it more than, the program is more than just meals. It is also nutrition education and importantly, a phone call every week from a volunteer to try to address the social isolation dimension of the, of the person who's living at home. Next slide. So what's cool about Cleveland, among other things, is the range of competitors they managed to bring to the table. The Cleveland United Way is a trusted broker there who's sort of a, a natural trusted broker in a lot of communities. But the Cleveland United Way is particularly unique because they were also a accountable health community backbone out of CMMI. And that gave them not only what the United Way normally does, and, and it is a world-class United Way, in case you're wondering, they also had been convening the community at large about different ways to think about social determinants, obviously doing the screening that was required in the ACH program, but that gave them a kind of unique vantage point, I think, to both see the potential of CAPTCHI and enabling them to finance something as opposed to just you know, screen and refer. And it gave them a chance to pull some of the very powerful uh, local healthcare organizations, including the Cleveland Clinic and Humana and, and, and United Healthcare, et cetera, that, that are integral to uh, the Cleveland experience. So it's, it's, a, it's a very nice coalition. We want to emphasize, as, as Lauren talked about, that you can't uh, do any of this without the trusted broker being incredibly uh, uh, talented. And the United Way in Cleveland personifies this. They, can, they have their own legal department. They've got their own financing structure, and they can handle uh, HIPAA-compliant databases. So they really do bring all the capacity necessary to bear. You can go to the next one. This gives you a, a little sense of the timing, even a place as sophisticated as Cleveland with the leadership of the United Way that they have. And, and they heard, uh, they, I guess, learned about Lauren, knew about Lauren, had her come talk in October of 18. Uh, then we did some more talks in, via Zoom, and then we made a site visit to Cleveland in early February of 2020. But the point of this is to show you, even though, uh, uh, we started the conversation with them that early. It took a couple of years to get to the actual implementation. Uh, they decided to move forward in July. They were the first to come back out of the COVID cave and be able to refocus on something other than the immediate. And they decided to do medically tailored meals together in July, but it still took until really uh, April of 21 before we had anybody enrolled. And part of that has to do with the timing that we'll talk about a little bit later, but part of it has to do with the natural implementation realities of getting all these different stakeholders to uh, submit uh, names and, and, and contact people and, and get uh, permission and, and consent and so forth. So let's keep going. So our experience in Cleveland to date, uh, we have 451 people who were referred from the various stakeholders. About 231 got service more than three months. Uh, I think it's fair to say we were a little surprised at how many people declined and how many people um, uh, pulled out after a little bit, but over 200 did finish and we still have 88 that are still getting service. Their, six, their particular six months is not over. We only have data from one stakeholder at the moment, so I don't want to say anything that's related to statistical inference, but I'll just say that it does appear encouraging that there was a decline in emergency room and inpatient spending of about 20% in that one uh, investor's uh, target group. But obviously we need way more analysis from all the investors to really understand what happened in Cleveland. So uh, let us turn now to our grand lessons of what we say, sort of what we think we've, we've learned over the last uh, summer vacation. So let's go to the next one. And I, I just wanted to start with saying, you know, What's amazing to me personally is how much energy there is out there in the, in the country. Uh, we're getting serious, I think, about social determinants for the first time. And there's no question that the pandemic and uh, George Floyd um, a murder and, and all the consequences of that made much more clear, I think, to way more people that we have to do something as a country to deal with inequity and we have to do something now. 
at the same time, there's a fair bit of consternation about, well, what should we do? There's a lot of lack of awareness of the literature that Lauren and others have, have reviewed over the years and contributed to, and, and the literature is not where we want it to be. There's no question about that. On the other hand, there is a lot of good evidence that very specific interventions for the right people can have the impact that we know we all want. And so that activity, that education is part of what's trying to channel this energy. The second learning I think we reached is that as much as we like to think about collaboration, it's sort of no one's day job. I mean, even the organizations that play trusted broker for us, they have to divert folks from their current job to do this sort of thing. And so it made us think we need to think hard as a country about how to invest in the collective infrastructure that might enable more communities to do more of this mutually beneficial collaborative work over time. I think, Lauren, you're going to take a couple of lessons. Now. Yeah, I'll take these next two. So the third lesson learned is uh, one of my personal favorites, which is that I think what we found is that CAPG is a sexy container for otherwise unsexy work. And let me tell you, when you Google image sexy container, you wind up in a deep, dark, strange place of the internet. <laughs> I thought this was the most appropriate image for sexy container. What I mean by that is that, you know, as Glenn said at the beginning, people are hungry for a financing mechanism. People have said, you know, man, what's really exciting is you've got Len Nichols and he's an economist. He does numbers. And it's really great that you've got someone like him thinking about social determinants of health. And that is 100% correct that we are all lucky Len turned his attention to this. But I think what we learned in part talking to communities and watching communities try and do this is many communities came to CAPG for the financing mechanism, this price assignment and the idea that, oh, you know, we don't have to reveal sensitive information to one another. But really what CAPG um, kind of forced on the communities and the coalitions, if you will, was a process of administration and coalition management and uh, review of evidence and contract negotiations. Um, and so that's what I kind of mean by the unsexy work. What we found is that um, a lot of communities come to CAPG for the financing, but then wind up, I don't know if they wind up staying for this, but what they wind up being, being thrust into is just a little bit more structured process for coalition management and project management than they may have otherwise had. And that's not surprising, right? Because I think to bring a community coalition together and not have an answer for how are we going to finance things, well, the energy is going to fizzle out pretty quickly, right? Because what do I keep showing up for meetings for? And you need to have a lot of meetings to do these things well if we don't have a, a way to figure out how to get really new money in the system and investments in the ground. But at the same time, if it was just a financing vehicle, it was just a theoretical price assignment, and we hadn't built out, I think, more of the governance structure about how to think about who's in the coalition and how to structure kind of the phases of work, et cetera, then I think, uh, you know, the financing piece alone would not have found a very ripe audience because there would have been no people and like butts in the right seats to make the key decisions, to forge the key relationships, to sign the contracts. And so uh, that's what I mean by an unsexy, unsexy work in a sexy container. Uh, the next one that I would say is just, I think one way in which Len and I were um, maybe a little naive, or at least something that we've learned over time, is when we were first selecting communities, we had a really high degree of emphasis on the trusted broker. And we said, you know, we need a really strong trusted broker in these communities or the communities are not going to make it through the CAPG process. And I think we were right on that. But I think we underestimated um, how much you need kind of an anchor stakeholder or an anchor bidder, if you will, uh, because often the trusted broker are the folks who are known around town as the do-gooders, or they're known around town as the people who are always trying to pull together the, the team for some collaborative work. And you need them, but I think we have found in the communities that really thrived, there was also someone, a health insurer, a health system, um, who was early in as well with the trusted broker saying, yeah, this really solves a problem for us because if we don't do CAPG, we're going to be asked to foot the whole bill for this investment. And so CAPG seems to us very attractive because it gives us a way to fit to foot part of the bill, but not the whole thing. And so where we had both a really energetic and, and high quality trusted broker 
and that kind of anchor stakeholder or bidder, I think we found much more success. Len, you want to take this one? Sure. Thanks, Lauren. So um, one of the issues, I think Lauren alluded to this uh, early on when she talked about how we, we just philosophically believe the communities have to pick what they want to do. And that's partly um, practical. If they don't want to do it, it's not going to work. So they've got to pick it. But when they pick what they want to do, they may not have in mind specific interventions that have already been tested and shown to work. And what we've discovered is, among other things, you, take, you think about the stakeholder coalition sitting around that table deciding what they want to do. They may have very different evidentiary standards. In some cases, people really do care about control groups and RCTs and all of that. And in other cases, they really want to do something that's particularly relevant to the population they want to serve where they are. And so that there's a tension between doing something that's been replicated and something that is really a gleam in the eye of, of the local players. And I think that that tension can play out in a number of different ways. What we tried to do to help them, we have these great colleagues at the Altarum Institute who did a world-class literature review. So any issue they were interested in, we would give them all the known literature and, and you know, summarize it for them and, and show them what we thought were the relevant choice points. We very much kept up with what Laura Gottlieb and her team at UCSF at Siren uh, are keeping up with. And of course, Laura and herself did a major literature review for Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation in Massachusetts a few years ago. So it wasn't for lack of literature. It was for the distance between what they really wanted to do and what had been proven elsewhere. And I'll give you a concrete example in Cleveland. Basically, they knew they wanted to do medically tailored meals. They knew they wanted to follow the Berkowitz work that had been done in Massachusetts and now in North Carolina. The vendor who does the work in Cleveland, the Benjamin Rose Institute on Aging, actually went to meet with Berkowitz team and they learned everything there is to know about how to do it. But Berkowitz work was all basically for two years and no one in Cleveland wanted to go two years with food. And so, and some wanted to go far longer than they did, but but because they wanted to be more consistent with the literature, but others said, no, 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 we're used to doing this two week stuff. So they settled on six months as a compromise. And it's a great way to sort of, we think, illustrate the reality between they're not willing to go beyond six months. So we kind of got to do that, but no one, neither Berkowitz nor us knew whether six months would be enough. And so I think you've got that tension that you've got to kind of take into account as you guide people, but they've got to choose what they want to do. Okay, Laura. So our penultimate kind of lesson learned here is um, that CAPG lowers the barriers to entry for collaboration, but it doesn't eliminate them. And um, what we mean by this is I think CAPG, particularly by virtue of structuring that confidential bid process, uh, I think creates a runway for uh, organizations, particularly in healthcare, who perceive themselves to be competitors to come to a joint enterprise and feel like there have been some guardrails put up that may prevent exploitation between the players. And so in that respect, I think CAPG really offers something meaningful and something that a number of other um, you know, financing models and, and joint collaborative work enterprises don't do. But I think Glenn and I have realized like you, we can't be, um, Pollyanna-ish about what CAPG can achieve, right? Even though we have a confidential bid process, there is still an investment of time that every coalition member makes to participate in the project. And in the beginning, it's very exploratory. You don't know if this project's going to sink or swim, be greenlit or walk away. And so even just that investment of time is a risk. And so that risk can still keep people from wanting to participate in these kinds of things. Um, and so, you know, we talk a lot in the CAPG world about trying to build trust and trying to lower the barriers to trust. I think CAPG is designed to lower the barriers to participation, particularly amongst competitors. Um, but it's not as if the trust requirements are zero uh, to do this kind of thing. You still got to show up, got to invest a little bit of time, you know, you've got to trust certainly the trusted broker that they're not going to breach confidentiality. There's a lot of trust that needs to happen around data flows and data security. 
And so I think this is just an opportunity for Lynn and I to be humble and both claim, like, I think this is an innovative aspect of CAPG, that it does intentionally try to lower barrier to entry, but it does not bring those barriers to entry to zero. Len, do you have anything else you want to say on this one before we go to the last? No, I think that was well put, Lauren. I, I think that's very well put. So let's just go on. So one of the more interesting developments in, in our uh, journey here has been the number of different kinds of organizations and people who have very similar sort of goals. That is to say, they're trying to figure out how to, how to jumpstart this energy in, uh, in social determinant space. How do we really take this stuff to scale? And that question has come to us in thousands of different ways. And I'll just say, it, it seems to us pretty clearly that uh, like we mentioned a little earlier, we really need to think hard as a country about how to invest more in local governance infrastructure. How do we support those people trying to do collaborative work that is going to be mutually beneficial, but it's not anybody's day job. And, and it doesn't take an economist very long to figure out, you know, you really wanna take this investment upstream of the healthcare system, which we know we all ought to do, you want to take that to big time scale, we're going to have to change the way our public programs enable and, and constrain health plans and then by extension uh, health providers uh, from spending money upstream. You know, what counts in the MLR and how do you decide uh, what health plans can pay for? Healthcare can't pay for everything. Lauren and I are strong proponents of the argument that there's not enough healthcare savings to pay for utopia. Okay, that's not going to happen. But at the same time, if we don't allow health insurers, for example, to put social spending in the, in, in the medical loss ratio and, and get credit for it, then you're basically telling them everything they do in this space has to more than pay for itself to make it worthwhile. And that seems to us to be a ridiculously high bar. So change in the payment incentives, change in the payment rules, is a pretty big structural policy change that we intend to try to articulate uh, in our future work. And then the strategies for scale up, you know, how could it really happen? Well, one way would be if more and more communities learn about CAPTCHI and they decide to do it like the ones that have implemented it already and, and or are considering it. But another way might be sort of on the supply side, what if a funder what if a government or a corporation, we've had quite a few feelers from some major corporations in the country thinking about collaborative work at the local level. What if they said, okay, look, this is this CAPTCHI stuff is one of a number of acceptable financing tools that we would then try to facilitate in a given community. We think that's really the way to take this stuff to, to scale in the, in, the, in the long run. So, I think we need to try to move to questions. So yeah, so let me just thank you all again for your attention today, Glenn and team for allowing us to do this presentation. There's the website for those of you who want more. I do want to take our last 40 seconds and, and plug a webinar that's going to be done on May 19th. And you can, we'll send details to all the people who are registered and, and, and watch today. But it, you know, as Glenn mentioned at the beginning, all of this work is about trying to address equity in our country. And we've had the privilege of, of talking to and working in a number of communities over the last few years. Nobody, in my opinion, is doing it as well as they are in the District of Columbia. And it's led by this Jane Bancroft Robinson Foundation team who are focused on essentially racial equity among women east of the Anacostia River both in terms of their breast cancer mortality, but also in terms of their job opportunities. And the work is just, it's, it's inspiring, it's exciting, and I uh, am proud to have uh, sort of, um, I guess you could say, uh, discovered how amazing they are, and we're gonna put them on national audience in, in May from the Urban Institute. So thank you again, Glenn, for allowing us to do this. We'll take questions, whatever now. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Lauren and Lynn. Just really impressive work and um, uh, visionary work, and you all have just stayed with it. Um, and uh, just tremendous opportunities for learning. So we've got a very robust set of questions already submitted. Um, I will say, I know already we've got 15 minutes or so to go through Q&A. Probably not going to get to all these questions, and we will say 
for, if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we will be following up um, with our speakers and others to, to get out um, uh, via email um, answers that we're not able to, to get live here. But so let's let's jump in um, to the Q&A box. Um, uh, one question, I think uh, a fairly focused question asking about the bidding process and whether um, whether you have stakeholders that can that are allowed to bid bid zero dollars for for the intervention. Go ahead, Len. So, yeah, great question. And I would say, you know, the basic idea is you want a coalition of the willing, right? But some are more willing than others, and some have more money than others. And so what sometimes happens, Glenn, is they offer things in kind if they don't have cash. And also we have participants who are sort of watching and thinking about doing it maybe next year. I mean, I mean, you know, it's interesting. When we started this, we thought the test of the model really is about will they do the model the second year? Will they do the model in the second time frame? Will they do it again? Okay, and so yes, you can bid zero, but go back to Lauren's fundamental constraint. If the sum of the bids don't exceed the cost, then you can't go forward. And, and by the way, you sometimes have to tell people, well, maybe you need to bid higher and, and that has happened as well. Lauren, anything you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I'd say there's two kinds of bidders who could quote unquote secretly bid zero. One is a, a bidder who really doesn't have any money. So I don't know if that would be so secretly bidding, but the kind of CBO example or someone further down the Q&A was asking about like intentional community involvement. And I think the DC webinar will, will address this in part, but you know, you can have patient advocacy groups or community organizing groups at the table and you know, you design your own coalition. And so you may anticipate those folks bidding zero. And so maybe it's a secret in the sense that they don't fully disclose to the other stakeholders, but everyone kind of understands they're likely to bid a low number because they don't have much cash on hand. That's one way to think about bidding zero. Another is kind of to have a strategic underbidder, a player that comes to the table, a health insurance company managed care plan, and they kind of surprise the trusted broker by bidding zero. And look, this is, this is where the game theory happens, right? They could get away with it right? In the sense that there could be excess surplus among the other stakeholders. So the project still goes forward and they wind up getting something for nothing. The risk is that if they try and strategically bid zero and so do their competitors and maybe so does a health system, well, then you're likely to not have the collective valuation or that some of the bids exceed the cost. And then everyone has to kind of pack up and go home and you say, well, you all just sunk a bunch of time in some meetings that isn't going to yield much. And so that's part of the guard against that strategic underbidding. Fantastic. Another question about geography and how this intersects with the model. Um, are there cases where you may have collaborating organizations that are serving overlapping but somewhat different geographic service areas? And how do you handle that in terms of partitioning out benefits and costs? So that is a great question. And it is true in almost every situation in America, right? Because health plans have different service areas. But what turns out to be true, Glenn, is the combination of the local coalition and the participating providers will have to agree upon a contiguous area. So it won't be the entire service area of a, of a, a catchment area for a hospital or a service area for a health plan, but it'll be Cuyahoga County or, or you know, whatever. So they have to agree on that ahead of time. Makes perfect sense. Thank, fantastic. Thank you. Um, several questions relate to um, uh, how how the model can handle potential interest in um, in tackling multiple social needs and maybe multiple interventions concurrently. Like, what if you wanted to do um, a, a food intervention plus a housing intervention? Um, other ways of handling that kind of bun bundles of interventions. Lauren, you want to take that? Sure. So I think about this, it, it, there's two strategies. One is you want to do two different interventions on two different groups of people. So they're really two distinct projects. You just think they're both very high priority. And in that case, the way that I, I would suggest to structure that is you basically do two CAPG processes, you know, and you meet nine to 10 on the first project and you bid on the first project and you go through the whole thing and you meet 10 to 11 on the second, but you run them as independent processes because then you're going to want to probably evaluate them to the extent that that's important to you separately. The alternative is kind of what Len was alluding to in one of our lessons learned. If you want to combine the interventions, 
for the same demographic group or the same intervention. That is completely intuitive. And I think this is the one of the major challenges in kind of social policy and social determinants research. You know, the reality of people's lived experiences, it's often not one social need that they report or have, it's multiple. And so wanting to do a multifaceted intervention makes sense. Communities can absolutely do that. They will be kind of designing their own intervention that is multi-component. You just run this, this kind of risk that we, the kind of projections or the estimates we can make ex ante about the effect size is going to have much larger confidence intervals around them because often those specific parameters haven't been previously tested. Yeah, and we have both those examples playing out. Waco is doing whatever people need uh, given the condition of, of a behavioral crisis in the family and, and Cleveland is doing very specific medically tailored meals for very specific people. So yeah, you, can, you could do both in the context. Great examples on that. Um, so another question following up about the free rider problem. Is there a way for this model to address free riders that simply don't come to the table, that just opt out of the system? And uh, the reference to Cleveland, and maybe there's one large health system there that's just not at the table. Um, and that is true. <laughs> they were there early on. And I'll just say their, their health economics people were in favor of it, but nevertheless didn't have it. So uh, yeah, it totally happens. And what I would say is they probably are going to benefit some way tangentially, right? And that's, it's, it's formally equivalent to a zero bid, right? And, and so it is indeed. But the way it is minimized, if you will, is that the people who get to nominate people to be the target group are the people who are part of the bidding coalition. So the, the hospital systems and the health plans that are participating get to name the people. Now, we all know people switch hospitals, people switch health plans, all that beneficiary stuff is what it is. But, um, and, and go back to Lauren's point, it is kind of fascinating. In the examples where we've, where we've seen success, that anchor bidder at the table has a kind of a salutary effect in that, okay, well, if they're here, I better be here because everybody knows I'm supposed to compete with them. And, and that, I would say, minimizes the, the risk, but it absolutely occurs and I don't think it's avoidable in real life. Yeah, definitely sounds like there's a, there is a built-in kind of peer, peer pressure mechanism. <laughs> yeah. So fantastic. So a couple of questions about the trusted broker role, which you mentioned you know, is, is really key here. Um, is there a way of financing or compensating for that role in this model? How is that built into the cost structure? So I would say um, in my life, I've made many mistakes, but probably the biggest one was not building in funding for the trusted broker into our original grant applications plan, because I, I frankly, I didn't know how much work they had that we were asking them to do. And so, yeah, there's no question we need to figure out how to fund that. They are the core of that infrastructure funding I'm talking about. And in Cleveland's case and Spokane, by the way, as well, they were backbones for CMMI. So the CMMI project gave them some funding that made it possible to think about this as an application of that work, right? But in general, uh, that kind of infrastructure support uh, does not exist. We were very fortunate in the organizations that are uh, uh, implementing CAPG, their organizations basically stepped up and, and allocated resources internally to make it happen. And uh, going forward, we will definitely uh, try to make sure those trusted brokers are funded because they are doing yeoman's work. And I would just say, Glenn, to put a finer point on it, in Cleveland, we've asked the trusted broker, how much time do you think it's been? And their estimate was half an FTE which is, okay. it's a bunch. Yeah. Um, they've done an exemplary job, but just a ballpark. And I think one way to handle this is you could always do cap sheet and get kind of foundation funding to cover the trusted broker time, or you could place the trusted broker time, like allocate 50 grand or whatever half an FTE is into your cost structure for the whole project, right? So you, the trusted broker could say, well, I know how much the playground costs plus 50 grand for our time. Now that's the number the bids need to cover. And that way you build it straight into the model um, and you don't have to do separate grant applications, et cetera. Yeah, and we will do that in the second round everywhere, no question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. 
Fantastic. So question about the time horizon for these projects in this model, uh, assuming these are multi-year initiatives, uh, are, are, you, are you getting multi-year commitments? Is there an endpoint to the commitment? How do you handle time horizon issues? So, you know, Glenn, when we think about the success of the model, it really is, will they do it again? Will they do the second round, the second year? And we, Lauren and I believe once they've spent that much time with us, they don't need us anymore. They can do this forever. We really are teaching the teachers, right? But we've got to get to that second round. Now, the second round will be defined by the length of the intervention at the beginning. In Cleveland's case, it's six months. So we'll be starting the second round in the second half of this year. And we already know we have at least one stakeholder there who's committed to that second round. We don't yet have the others, and we'll see how that plays out. Mm -hmm. In Waco, they are still in the middle of generating data and the police just started nominating people to, to be enrolled. So they're not ready to get to that second round. They will get there sometime later in 22. Mm -hmm. In Albany's case, they're done with the first round. They, they've gotten their shots in arms. They had a very successful outreach program, first sort of overcoming technology barriers and then overcoming the more traditional fear of the healthcare system and distrust and so forth. And they declared victory in their booster shot uh, numbers. And they're now thinking about what to do next. Mm -hmm. So it really does depend upon the horizon of the specific SDOH intervention and then the process for getting the data back to folks and, and getting the analysis done. Fantastic. I'm going to try to squeeze in at least one more question. Question about potential roles of Medicaid and state Medicaid agencies in this work. You mentioned some of the payment challenges and we have seen some Medicaid waiver programs like in North Carolina that now they've got, you know, federal approval to spend Medicaid dollars on social services. Um, uh, and then some others raising, because Sarah Rosenbaum wrote, wrote a recent health affairs blog cautioning against that, you know, that tendency. So what are your thoughts about Medicaid and Medicaid waivers and their ability to fit with this model? So what we observe is that in Cleveland, the state of Ohio had put in their RFP for the MCO contracts, the July of 19, okay? So the applications had to be in that fall. Uh, they had to show, uh, MCO had to show, A, what they were already doing on social determinants. And they were going to be allowed to spend a certain amount of the total premium dollar if they did it in certain social determinant categories, Glenn. So the, 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 the state Medicaid uh, RFP was crucial to mm -hmm. getting the plans to the table, no question. Texas, which you might guess, does not have a similar Medicaid <laughs> program, but Baylor Scott White did it because they knew this particular population, these families with people having so mental health uh, issues, were sufficiently costly and they knew what their healthcare system was doing for them wasn't enough and they were willing to take a chance and, and to see how it might play out because they had some, you know, some hope. So I would say the state Medicaid agency encouragement is crucial, uh, but it, you know, once you've seen one state Medicaid RIP, you've seen one. So there really needs to be, in my view, a much broader conversation about what makes the most sense. North Carolina is a great example, um, but I would say uh, what really would be better than a waiver is to get it in a state plan amendment and, and get it in the MLR. Now to Sarah's very good and, and cautionary point, and you know, Sarah's my go-to Medicaid expert as she is for most of us. You know, I think there is a very clear line that has to be drawn. Thou shalt not take healthcare dollars beyond this point. I don't know where that line is, Glenn. What I see, maybe Sarah does better than I do, but I'll just say what I see is a lot of these activities we're talking about do have health impacts. And if you think about a world in which instead of paying for medically necessary services, we paid for health, then it's hard to say we shouldn't spend Medicaid dollars on something that improves health. Again, healthcare can't pay for all of it, but in my view, we should pay for more than we are now. Fantastic. Well, I know we haven't gotten to everybody's questions. Again, we will be following up via email and hopefully get, get some more of these questions answered. Thank you again so much uh, to Lynn and Lauren. Uh, this model is a real inspiration is a, a, a tremendous opportunity for learning for all of us who are trying to help sectors work together uh, to tackle issues in health and health equity. 
Um, hope we can continue to follow your work and, uh, and share lessons learned. And uh, thanks to everyone uh, for joining us. Please join us, join us uh, again. Um, and we'd love to hear from you. Thanks, Have a great thanks, day, everybody. Glenn. Thank you.